Let us pray. Loving God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, be present here as I speak and be present wherever it is that we are listening. May there be more of you and less of me in the things that I say. And may we be be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the power of your love at work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I indicated at the beginning of our service, as we enter into what the church calls ordinary time, we're preparing ourselves for a 12-week preaching series looking at the life of, of the Apostle Paul as we journey through the lectionary readings we find in the book of Romans. This preaching series is going to be called Seasons of Grace. Uh, And what we want to do today, by looking at this passage that comes to us from Romans chapter 5, is a bit of a a prelude as to what we're going to experience over those 12 weeks. And this passage before us, from Romans chapter 5, is a great glimpse, just in a few verses, of who this person Paul is. The journey that they were on as a person, and the communities that they journeyed with. So we find in these few verses some key words that Paul brings to us, words like grace and what that means for his understanding of of faith. And there are some other key words like suffering and endurance and hope. And we see with these words a description of who Paul is as a person, the experiences he has gone through that helped shape his understanding of God. And for the 12 weeks of our series, where these words will have greater significance for us as we look at some of the doctrines of the Christian faith and how church is understood as a community that becomes the body of Christ. But before we enter into some of the descriptions that this, these few verses give to us, I want to share a story with you. There was a guy who was in a car traveling down a country road And alongside of him, he sees a little bit of a mini dust storm. It's keeping pace with the car that he's in. And he he looks out the window and he realizes that he's being chased by a chicken. How can a chicken be traveling at 60 kilometers an hour, he thinks. And he looks a little bit closer and he realizes the chicken has three legs. He thinks, wow, a three-legged chicken. Let's just see how this chicken moves, shall we? So he increases his speed up to 80 kilometers an hour and sure enough... The chicken keeps pace. He goes up to 100 kilometers an hour on this back road in the country, and this three-legged chicken not only keeps up, but starts to overtake. And then, all of a sudden, darts down this country lane. The man in the car has to squeal on the brakes, does a U-turn, and follows the chicken up the country path. The chicken is almost like dust in the back, in the foreground, but then goes into a farmyard. And so the man in the car can't help but follow and finds himself in the, in the farmyard of, of a farm that has three-legged chickens. They're running everywhere. He sees them. They're scooting here, they're scooting there. They're so fast, he can hardly, his eyes can hardly follow them. And sure enough, the farmer comes out to greet the car. And the man says to him, I've just seen all these incredible three-legged chickens. Where, where do they come from? And the farmer says, oh, I breed them here. We breed three-legged chickens, and they are so fast. They just scoot around the place. The man looks at him, he says, three-legged chicken? Why would you breed a three-legged chicken? And the farmer says, well, I don't know about you, but I, I like a drumstick when it, at dinner time. I love a good drumstick. And the man says, well, yeah, I love one too. It so happens that my partner loves a good drumstick as well. I'm married, and my partner loves a good drumstick. I love a good drumstick. The man in the car says, yeah, I'm I'm married too. My partner loves a drumstick. I love a drumstick. And he says, well, the the thing is, we sometimes like to have people over for dinner. And our guest inevitably likes a good drumstick too. And the man in the car says, yeah, I can see that. And so the farmer says, so we decided to breed a three-legged chicken so I could have a drumstick, my partner could have a drumstick, and our guest could have a drumstick. And the man in the car is just nodding and smiling. That's a fantastic idea. A three-legged drumstick, a three-legged chicken. So there's three drumsticks, one for you, one for your partner, one for your guest. That's amazing. What do they taste like? And the farmer says, well, if we can ever catch one, I'll let you know. There's a sense here that the idea of a three-legged chicken 
that can provide three drumsticks is almost too good to be true. If we can ever catch one, we could know what they taste like. For some of us, this is almost a description of what religion looks like, of what faith looks like, perhaps even what our relationship with God looks like. It's something beyond our reach, something we can't actually take hold of because it's just too fast for us. It's just, just beyond the, bounds, the boundaries of our own desire, our own ability. The Apostle Paul writes in a context that is sometimes similar to this, that people understood God as something that was beyond their understanding and recognition and experience. And there's much of the Christian faith that would testify to this. But Paul wants to say something different alongside of this, to say God is also closer than we could ever imagine. And our best theology should not keep God at a distance, but draw God close. And there is a challenge here for us to engage with. So when Paul uses words like justification, he's not wanting to use a term that keeps God at a distance. He's wanting to use a term that brings God close. When I first became a Christian, I found the language of the church that I was a part of used words like justification and sanctification and other words that I'd never heard used in everyday speech. And I found it hard to understand what was being spoken about. This word justified is often thought of as a legal term because of its association with the word justice and the way we think of justice today. There's an image on your screen now that is often used as, as the personification of justice. And we have this phrase in our Western world that justice is blind. In other words, justice does not have favourites. Everyone is equal before a notion of justice. But this is not the biblical understanding of justice at all. In the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish people had a very clear understanding that God does have favourites. The Jewish people were God's favourites. God had chosen the Jewish people and blessed the Jewish people that they might be a blessing to others. In the New Testament, the, the, the Christian faith describes God's relationship with people differently. Through the words of Jesus, we come to understand that God's favourites are no longer the Jewish people, but rather the poor, the lost, the lame, the blind, the sinner, the tax collector, the prostitute. Jesus says, a doctor does not come for those who are healthy, but for those who are sick. It seems that God, God has favourites and shows favour towards those who are broken and lost and are in need of healing and help. So this notion of blind justice is certainly not one that we will find in Scripture. So what does it look like then to understand that God has favour towards some people rather than others? And for those of us who do not consider ourselves blind or lost or broken, perhaps that's a hard concept for us to get our heads around. I once heard a preacher uh, put this word justification into these words. To be justified is to be just as if I'd never sinned. And that was an understanding that, that I, I could come to grips with. This idea of being justified is being made right with God. That God, when God looked at me, God did not see someone um, who was separate from God because of sin, but rather someone who was welcomed into the heart of God because of the power of God's love. This idea of justice then is not so much about law, but about relationship. In fact, in the language of the New Testament, the word for justice and the word for righteousness are the same word, dikaiosune, and it is all about relationship. To be in right relationship with God, to be in right relationship with one another, was to be justified. And to be in right relationship is to surrender to the love that binds us together. It turns out that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is not bound by the law, but rather uh, bound by this idea of love as the great experiment of inclusion, a love that would bind people together, regardless of 
of their history, regardless of what their, their present might be, the hope that there might be a future they might share together. To be justified is to be just as if I'd never sinned towards God, just as if I'd never sinned towards my sister or my brother. To be justified is to be reconciled, to understand ourselves as a community of God, as one people, a community that demonstrates the love of God for the world to see. So, with this in mind, I have some questions for you. Are you comfortable with the idea that God has favourites? How does it make you feel? Do you think the way you feel about this might differ if you were poor or lost or broken or a sinner? Do you think much about sin? Do you think of yourself as a sinful person? And if sin is that which diminishes our right relationship with God and our right relationships with others, does this challenge your idea of what is sinful and what isn't? Spend some time thinking about these questions with the people that you're watching this video with. Or if you're by yourself, you may like to call someone or perhaps even journal your thoughts and responses to these questions. Take some time to do that now. Paul moves on from this idea of justification and being justified by faith to talk about this notion of grace. And if we find that justified is a Christianese term, more so and more problematic is this idea of grace. What does grace actually mean? Grace, if we understand it properly, is actually not just about um, feeling good about one another. It's not always a notion that is welcomed. Grace, understood properly, can also be offensive. Because along with this idea of justification... Grace means that we are often find ourselves in the company of people we don't like, the company of people who may have injured us, the company of people who we may have injured ourselves. The inclusion of grace means that we are often called to walk alongside people who are very different to ourselves. Now, if we want to understand what this grace might look like, we get a bit of a hint in a phrase that Paul uses in this text called, the, the phrase in the Greek language is described with these three words, the love of God. And we find this in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Love of God in the original Greek language has this ambiguity around it, just as it does in the English language. When we say the love of God, we can think of that in terms of the objective genitive or the subjective genitive. And the difference is this, the love of God can mean God's love for us or the love of God can mean our love for God. To understand Paul's notion of grace, we're challenged to think that both of these meanings go together. In other words, it is because of God's love for us through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we are able to have love for others. There's a challenge here that Paul gives to us, that we are to think of love already in the world. God's love for the world has permeated everywhere. There is no place that we will go that God's love has not gone before. But that love is also an invitation. So God's love goes into the world, God's love is poured into our hearts, that we might have love to show for others, that we might have love to give to others, that we might have love that empowers others. So this understanding of grace then is almost, almost becomes like the air that we breathe. There is no place that we will go that there is not already air waiting for us, just like it is the love of God. And this is hard for us to understand, that God's love could be in places that seem broken, that seem that seem filled with pain, that seem filled with loss. But there's a challenge for us to think that God's love is in the midst of the places where pain exists, looking for healing, looking for justice, and there is an invitation for us to follow, to participate in what God is already doing. So the author Philip Yancey says that this idea of grace might be hard for us to understand, but we're not asked to understand it. We're not asked to comprehend it. We're asked to convey grace. We're asked to live grace. 
That's what it means to be the body of Christ. Which brings us to the notion of hope. Paul's understanding of hope is not some pie-in-the-sky fantasy. It's actually concrete. It's about lived experience. And in this text in Romans 5, we see what that looks like for Paul. The hope that Paul has is one that comes from the character that has formed in his life, and that character is one that has formed through the endurance that he has experienced through the suffering that has come his way. And as we look through Paul's life, we see this time and time again. Suffering produces endurance, produces character, produces hope. So in this time post-COVID-19, what hope has arisen for us from our experiences that we've shared together, that you've shared in isolation? Are you hoping things will go back to the way they were or are you hoping for something different? How have you changed over the last few months during this time of isolation and how will these changes in you bring change to our church community when we join together once more in public worship? I want you to reflect on these questions. So I mentioned at the beginning of our service and in our announcement time about the protest movement called Black Lives Matter. And over this last few weeks, we've seen protest movements overseas and here in Australia where people have gathered around this slogan, Black Lives Matter. And there has been some pushback. Some people have found this this slogan, this protest, very hard to connect with because often the cry that comes back in response, and maybe you're familiar with this, is when people say black lives matter, often the response they hear is all lives matter. Um, Can I please encourage you not to do that? And there's there's a significant reason why. And it comes down to our understanding of justification. It comes down to our understanding of grace. I want you to imagine that you're a pedestrian on the street and you see someone get hit by a car and an ambulance has to come and pick them up and take the the emergency services, take the body out of the car, they're injured, they're in need of help, they put them in an ambulance and they're taken to hospital. At that point, if you're someone, a pedestrian, who has seen this happen and you call out, why don't I get to ride in the ambulance, you'll have an understanding of what it is to cry back, all lives matter. Black lives matter... Is not, does not suggest only black lives matter. Black lives matter is a protest against a system that has caused injury and injustice to people of colour. We don't need to say all lives matter. That's like being that pedestrian who says, why don't I get to ride in the ambulance? It's a recognition that God has favourites, that Jesus has come for the broken and the lost, not for those who are well and those who are whole. For those of us who find the slogan, Black Lives Matter, difficult, that's what the good news of Jesus Christ looks like. It's often difficult for us to hear, especially for those of us who live with a life of privilege and well-being. It's difficult for us to understand that sometimes we are part of the problem. But this is the offence of grace, and that is what is so amazing about God's love. To be justified with one another, to be justified with God, it's it's to understand that when God looks at us, it's just as if black lives matter. It's just as if the broken and the lost and those who've experienced injustice are welcomed into the heart of God and the divine embrace of God's love. And it's just as if As a church, we are called to share that love with those in most need. Let us pray. God, thank you that your love transforms us and challenges us and remakes us anew. Help us to look for ways to engage with this idea of justice, this idea of grace, this idea of all conquering love that you have for us, that we might see justice abound, flowing like a river, and that we might be justified in right relationship with you and with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.